GP introduction. Hi everyone, my name is Dale, as you mentioned. Uh, this is my wife and family here. I'm showing my app right now, so if you want to follow along, you're free to download the app. If you can't see the TV very well, I hope you guys can see it. It's our first time trying this outdoors and connected to the truck. We're trying all sorts of new things. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Can you believe it worked? <laughs> it worked. I love it. That thing's been in the back of my truck for like three years. I've never used it. And then Noel was like, well, we just had one of those. I was like, I think I have one. <laughs> so, who's going to jump your truck? He, he will. I got okay. jumped <laughs> The circle of life. <laughs> so so um, this is my backyard here. And I want to show this because this is what led to us building the app and to me being here today. Um, three years ago, I knew nothing about gardening, uh, but I've dealt with anxiety and depression my whole life. And I found this book called The Depression Cure that talked about seven ways you can help with anxiety and depression. It was getting sunlight, eating the right foods, getting enough water. You guys can feel free to sit down, by the way, if you want. Don't feel like you got a fan. Sorry, I just didn't want to I want my tattoo. Okay. So the guy who's going to jump the battery will pull me back up. <laughs> I, I'll get you. Uh, yeah, I'm free. To, just let me know if you want to do we can offset each other. Yeah, yeah, we'll there we go. Daughter is. So, um, so those seven things that I learned about that book kind of all pointed me towards the idea of starting with the garden. Um, really, our budget did too because we started buying food, you know, spinach and kale and basil and oregano and all these things I was reading about that that would help me, and it was really expensive. And uh, so that's what started the seed. <laughs> I didn't even mean to do that. Of the idea of um, planted the idea. There we go. <laughs> so many funds um, of starting a garden, and and really, so we started with this, and and it wasn't until I tried spinach for the garden from the garden for the first time that things told my this took over my life. That was really the moment for me because in the past I knew spinach as something that either Popeye ate or something that I thought was gross, but it wasn't something I wanted to grow or eat. But once I grew it and I saw those, you know, the leaves are way different than they are in the, the spinach you get from the store. They're, they have texture to them and they have, each has a different taste. And, and, and it, was a, it was a big moment because with that taste, I, I realized, comes the added nutrition and all of the things that can help, you know, keep us healthy. So, so that's basically what led us into doing this and everything we learned through doing this, I, I'm a little... I'm, so I'm on the autism spectrum and I get very obsessed about things. This has been my thing for the past three years. So I've memorized all these gardening books for the most part. I've, I've just all I do is read about garden. I take all that stress that I feel about the world and I put it into this. Um, I don't read the news anymore or do any of that. I only do this. So <laughs> it's how I've been able to manage the past few years. So yeah. So so all of that basically. You know, I was carrying around all these books. I was, you know, when I was trying to like, learn this all, I, was, I had these, you know, these YouTube channels. I was, I, all, I just immersed myself in this world. And basically I took all of that information and put it into this app. So I'm gonna use this app today to, to drive the presentation and talk about how you can start growing food. This growing guides tab has uh, 70 different vegetables you can choose from. So if you choose beans, for example, and a tap on it, it will give you exact dates for when you can plant. And this is based on where you live. So if you tap on the settings button here, you can, I don't have internet connection, so it's, I can't show some of this, but if I tap the update location, it would update, you would see the new date, and it would refresh based on, on where you are. Um, you can also tap on here to see the different chances of freeze for your area. So, and you can use that to drive the dates. So if you want to play it risky, like I normally go for March 31st, this year obviously I didn't, but that's normally when I try and get my stuff out, at least my first round, so I can set mine to March 31st, and then all the dates throughout the app will be changed. But by default, we go with the, the safest date, the, the date you know that over the past 100 years has been the average last frost date for that area. So um, once you choose what you want to grow, it shows you how to grow it. You know, It gives you all the details on it and, and all of that. Um, it shows you, if I'm scrolling too fast, let me know. Uh, if we have any blog posts on our website that are about that, it pulls them in. We have a blog where we show how we grow, like basically everything we do, we blog about or shoot videos about. So we, that all comes into here for each vegetable. It has companion plants where you can see what grows well next to each vegetable. And then tap on those. You can also see what doesn't grow well next to each one and what to avoid planting. And then uh, which pests attack each one. And then you can tap on the pests to read about what to, what to do about it. And then every option, every treatment option we have in here are the things we use. We don't use any pesticides, no herbicides, nothing like that. Um, 
we, you know, we use ladybugs or for aphids. But really for aphids, I just spray them off. That's what I tell you in the app, just spray them off. But if it's overwhelming, you know, you can do things like buying ladybugs. Um, for cucumber beetles, we make these, these traps. You, you can buy traps, but we like to make these. Yeah, we, we see these yellow cups here? You can take those yellow cups and put sticky glue around the outside of it and then put something to attract them on the inside, like a cotton swab of, a, of like clove essential oil and then that'll gravitate this to the cucumber beetles. They like that clove essential oil for some reason. But you could also just put cucumber on there, you know, like obviously that'll bring them in. I'm trying to figure out how to make something like this for squash bugs. And if I ever figure it out, I'm gonna retire. <laughs> those squash bugs, they're just smartest little things ever. I have had so many epic battles with those things. If you haven't dealt with squash bugs yet, they, they, they can, so they, they'll hide from you. They'll see you coming and they'll hide underneath a leaf. And then you come around and they go around like it's just, <laughs> the key for them, and I'll get more into bugs and everything else here in a little bit, but I'm gonna go mention this while it's fresh in my mind. The key I found to hunting squash bugs is to spray the plant with water. And every other time I say never spray a, spray a plant with water, especially squash, because it can cause powdery mildew. But if you're hunting, it's okay. So just spray the plant and, those, and the squash bugs think it's rain or they, they, they gravitate towards the top. They start climbing and then, um, you just use your eyes you just sit there and stare at the plant and you'll see movement humans are really good at that um, and then then you can know where, where to go but I'll get more into that later I just want to mention it while it's fresh in my mind so do a, a water gun for gardeners mm -hmm. they have a salt gun have you heard of that the no. bug assault you load it with salt and it shoots out like a shotgun blast of salt um, now obviously the the thing that I'm concerned about with that is if you do it too often that you can change the salinity in your soil right. and you know, cause too many problems. But if I'm like, I'm totally gonna get one just for cabbage butterflies. You know, cabbage moths, like we can probably see them flying around now. Just, it sounds like so much fun just going out. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna start, that's kind of by, I mean, uh, by showing this this getting started tab now. So if, if you wanna start growing food, this is basically the recommendations that everything we've learned has gone into, this is what, how we recommend getting started. So I'm gonna go through these steps now and use that to kind of drive the rest of the presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to this is very informal, raise your hand or yell at me if I don't see you. That's all fine. So the first step um, is to choose the right location. And this is something I did not do in mind, so that's why I have it as the first step. Um, when I first started my garden, my first raised bed was on, we're south, I need to get my orientation right. South is south, okay. So my first raised bed was uh, there was a fence right, so it's this kind of situation right here. Imagine a fence right here, and I put the bed right here. Uh, now I built it in May or something, so I think it was April or May. So, um, you know, our, they, were in the, they were in the sun in that month. Well then come fall, they were in the shade, and I couldn't grow anything, in, you know, except for lettuce in the fall. So, um, so anyway, you've got to consider that. You've got to think about the sun. And it was the first time in my life that I think I had thought about really the sun and where it is and how it works. Like, I'm kind of ashamed to admit that, but I didn't, I didn't know, like, I didn't know, I had never thought about how, like, the sun in that way at all. So, do, you've got to go through that mental exercise with every part of your yard. Um, but the thing is, in Oklahoma, we need shade, especially in the afternoon. So that east part of your house is some of the most valuable property you have to grow food because it gets shaded in the afternoon from the afternoon sun. So, um, and that's really the big thing with, with the location is you've got to, sun is the biggest thing. There's other factors too. If you have an area that collects a lot of water, you don't want to do an in-ground bed there. You know, you can do a raised bed or smart pots or something that, will, you know, we'll get into those here in a minute. But um, you really just want to spend some time thinking about your yard and, you know, thinking about where you want things to be. And, and different plants like different microclimates is what they're called. They're like different zones of being in different types of conditions. So you want to think about that too. <laughs> as far as, so with our yard, we started with just an urban lawn, um, just Bermuda grass everywhere. And I could have gone through and dug it all up, but that seemed like a lot of work and I didn't want to do that. So um, the Square Foot Garden book recommended the, uh, the black weed cloth. Um, and that's the first book I started with. And I tried that and he apparently had never dealt with Bermuda grass because it does not work at all. It just creates this mess of tangled black stuff that never decomposes. So um, it, it only took one season to learn that. And then I switched to cardboard. So what I did was I just went through and laid out my entire backyard with cardboard and then started covering it with wood chips. You can see the back of my truck is full of wood chips right now. Pretty much every week I go to the Norman Compost facility and get a load and dump it somewhere. It's my exercise, I need to do more of it. I've been like 30 pounds over the winter, so like, this is just the way that I blow off stress. My lunch break at work is I go outside and unload wood chips and I listen to podcasts. 
So that's just kind of what I do. I work from home, so that's just you know how I. Uh, and I stare at computers all day, so I need that doing something time to not go crazy. Um, that's what led to me doing all this to begin with, because I was at a computer too much. So, so once you cover the, the ground with cardboard, I, I recommend doing as many layers of cardboard as you can, up, up to three. Up more than that's probably crazy, but um, you know, it's, it's definitely two, because that Bermuda will find its way through, and it's just a nightmare. And if you can, if you can get enough cardboard to do two, it's definitely worth it. Some sources I found for how to get bulk sources of large pieces of cardboard because you don't want to do like a bunch of tiny Amazon boxes. I've done that, and then the wind picks up and you're just like chasing Amazon boxes. Um, so big boxes are, are great, you know, like TV boxes, patio furniture boxes, uh, lawnmower boxes. So try and find a store local to you that has those types of things coming in on a regular basis that isn't a super corporate store. Because Lowe's and Home Depot and all those places have their processes for cardboard. They don't want to, yeah, they're not interested. But those local stores, like they ha usually have a surplus of cardboard they're happy to get rid of. And they're generally happy to help out with the community anyway. So find one of those places around you. And, and that's where I got my large pieces of cardboard. Um, so uh, another thing I want to mention is convenience. Uh, don't have your garden like way out where you never see it. Um, otherwise, uh, out of sight, out of mind is definitely a thing. Um, we have challenges where our dogs like to eat our plants too. So <laughs> most of our gardens are separated by a fence, but we still have stuff around our patio that we like to cook with a lot. So I have uh, the same energy that I put into collecting football cards goes into collecting herbs now. So I've got like one of every herb that I can find. So I've got all of those like around the patio that I like to cook with and that type of thing. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it on location. I think I covered all the bases there. Are there any questions over that before we move on to the next section of getting started? Um, east is difficult for me. That's where our flower garden is. Mm -hmm. So what, I just put some things in pots yesterday before I saw your class today. So I put it on the south side of my house, but it's um, up against a little wall mm -hmm. so that hopefully as that sun moves across, it'll get some shade. Yeah. I mean, how much... When you say sun, like for flowers, full sun is what, six to eight hours of sun? Yeah. What yeah. is it for vegetables? Same. Like uh, In Oklahoma, six to eight hours is enough for anything. Yeah. Um, especially in the summer. Like tomatoes are in the north are full sun, right? Well, in Oklahoma, they don't get shade in the afternoon or they don't get some sort of help, especially if they're out there, the wind being battered all day. It just really stresses them out. And it leads to not getting as many tomatoes because when the temperature gets above 90, 95, tomato um, the flowers start dropping. So they don't produce fruit. They wait till it gets cooler again. Well, if that plant, if that plant's cooler, then you get tomatoes longer into the summer before that happens, and then you get them again sooner. So, so if you plant them on the north side of your house, where they may not get the direct sunlight, I mean direct sun, but they're out in sunlight, and mm -hmm. some shade, does that work? I wouldn't do it right up against on the north side of your house, but if you've got some distance, I mean, they need to get direct sun for six to eight hours, So, uh -huh. it, especially tomatoes. There are things that don't require that, like lettuce and kale, like don't necessarily have to have full sun, they can be in the shade. Okay. Um, and the app will help guide you through that, like on um, each vegetable, if you go into it, it has the sun requirements here, and it says if it's full sun, and I'm, right now it says full sun, part sun, like I want to make that experience better, like because people, like, I think, especially when I started, I didn't understand what that meant and stuff, so I want to give numbers here and stuff, mm -hmm. but I, but it's hard because in Michigan it's different than it is here. So I've got to find out how to <laughs> do fine. that. Yeah. So that's on my list of things I want to make better in the yeah, app. Glossary. Hmm. Just a dictionary glossary type thing. Well, I need to do like programmatically. I need to be able to do that, like yeah. based on a GPS location. Uh, you and, customize and, it. Yeah, without having to go through and type like every city. You know, like <laughs> the, I need to be able to automate it, and I'm still working on that part of it. But I have. That's one of the area that one area of the app I really want to make better. Um, I'm glad you mentioned this part too because you said like what would I do um, one thing you can do is you don't have to have just have shade from a house um, I build shade walls all the time mm -hmm. where I just stick two t-posts in the ground and then I put shade cloth between them I attach it with zip ties I put that on the west side of the bed so now I've got a wall that's that's made just from shade cloth and t-posts and that's super cheap because t-posts are everywhere on the side of the road mm -hmm. I mean I get them off next door as a social network for, for neighborhoods like all the time Okay. And then shade cloth, I used to get at garage sales or things like that. I pick it up all the time in like places like that. Um, another thing you could do in addition to doing the shade cloth on the west side is do a living wall. So instead of, uh, so you could do two T posts and then some sort of concrete mesh panel. I'm, like see that thing right, the, the, the arch you see right there? Mm -hmm. Like something made out of something like that. 
like they have these concrete mesh panels that are eight bucks at Home Depot. They're four by eight, and you can put that and then attach the to the T post with the zip ties there, mm -hmm. and then you can grow something that vines up that wall. Mm -hmm. So Lufa is a great candidate because of how vigorous it is. A lot of the winter squashes are like that. Whole beans are a good option. Cucumbers, but they'll vine up that wall. So in the spring right now, there's no shade coming over, but I don't need shade in the afternoon right now for that stuff. But by the time I do. Um, now I've got this living wall that it's getting all the sun, which I like is a better idea than the shade cloth because I'm being more efficient with the light that I'm getting coming into my space. I'm not just having it go under a shade cloth that's doing nothing with it. I've got a plant that's doing something with it. Does that make sense? Yes. And then I also do a lot of like arches. So like Aldi right now has their like arch for like 30 bucks or something like that. And uh, I, I buy those and stick them up everywhere and then do things that go over it. My, life, my wife really loves arches. So it just... You know, I get a lot of brownie points and it looks nice. So, um, so I put those on the west side of things. Another thing you could do is plant something like sage, especially like if you have like a three year sage plant or like a bigger transplant you can get, it's going to get really big. And you put that on the west side of your bed, it's going to create shade for everything in there. So, and that's where companion planting comes into play. And we'll show some of that with the smart pots and we'll talk about that more, but you can use plants to help other plants. And that's one of the ways you do it is with cr like plants creating shade for others. You could do okra on the west side of your bed. It's going to get really tall and then it shades everything down on the okay. east side. So I could put it in, in that dog, it used to be a dog run. Mm -hmm. So I could put it on the north side of my house, but then do an arch or something where the west sun would just beat it. To I would just be careful being on the north side of your house because again, that's the same situation I ran into my fence because I was on the north side of that fence. And like right now, it's full sun outside, but this doesn't get shade, and this won't get. I mean, yeah, this won't, won't get sun all, all day. So if you're going to be on the north side, be far away enough from the house that you're that, in that strip in the yeah. middle. Yeah, and remember that that shade is going to move. Yeah. So in the fall, it's going to be out to here. Or Leah, you've been here enough; you can probably tell where it goes. But you know, it's going to change. So if you want to grow year round, then you've got to consider that, because that's that mistake I made where I didn't consider that and I put it right here, and then I, and then I had to. I mean, fortunately, I'm glad I had to expand out because it made me build more gardens. You know, now God, I did it, but. At the time, I was thinking, I didn't know I was going to be having so many gardens back then. Mm -hmm. So it was a, you know, so hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank awesome. you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions before we move on to the container part of it? Okay. So the next, start, uh, the next part of this is container. So um, I started with raised beds. Um, you can see these raised beds I've got built everywhere here. They're a great option, but they cost more. Um, I know a lot of people are intimidated by the idea of going to home or wherever and buying wood and then bringing it home and cutting it and all of that. So um, for that and other reasons, I'm a big fan of the smart pots. So I've got this this one here as an example. These like this is the one I've got. I got like 12 of these in my backyard, and they're they're large. So you can see like they're the size of a raised bed basically. And you just buy this, you unfill it. I mean, you, you unfold it, you fill it with with potting mix, or you can make your own. You can save a lot of money by making your own. And then that's, and these are the same things you see over there that, we've, that they've got. The, I think those are 25 gallons over there. Um, this is 100 gallons here, but they've got a lot of different sizes. And the thing that's cool about these is that the sides are breathable. So normally plants are only, only able to get oxygen from the top. Well, whenever the roots hit the side here, they don't just circle like they do in containers. They still suck in oxygen from the side. So you do have to water these a little bit more. My raised beds are somewhat, mostly buried at this point because of how many wood chips I put around it. So I don't really have to water them that much. Mm -hmm. But because these smart pots sit up, you know, like I've got to water them at least one, maybe two days earlier than everything else. But I have my auto, my, I have my watering automated. I'll show you that here a little bit. That is a consideration. But I really like the smart pots. They make it super simple to get going. I've done tests where I've grown um, that bed right there. I did a test in where I put peppers in that one and peppers right next to it. And I did the exact same thing. And the peppers in there actually did better. Now I need to do this a couple more times, you know, like I need more data, but um, I was so skeptical of these because I thought for sure, like this big black container in the middle of the July Oklahoma sun is gonna get way too hot, mm -hmm. but they, they really do well. So um, they're a great option to get started with. Um, the square foot gardening book again is what I started with. Um, and it has a really good guide about how to build um, raised beds, but it's simple. I mean, it's just, you take blocks, you have wood, you screw it together and that's pretty much it. Um, I do have links in the app uh, to all the different sizes of smart pots, and we also have a, a smart pots page in the app in the menu here that has uh, recommendations for each smart pot of what you can plant in it. So if you go to like 25 gallon, it lists off all the things that can be planted in there. So, and then the, one of the next updates we're going to have out soon is going to have the reverse. So for each vegetable, it's going to give you the right size for each one. 
They're based out of Oklahoma here too, and they're really cool people. They, they've they've helped us out a lot. They've given us a lot of stuff to give away and, th and things like that generally. So they're good people. That matters to me. Um, any questions about containers? I spent a lot less time on that than the previous. So. So you would put that right over the cardboard? Yeah, so, yeah, um, what I've done with the smart pots so far is I've had them on top of the wood chips even. Um, now, the thing is, like, roots can actually get through the bottom of those, like, the smart pot too. So, um, if you, could, if, if you put it on cardboard, I don't know how well, the, I, I almost think it'd be better to put on top, to have it on the wood chips. Um, I've also tried a smart pot that I buried because when I started, I, I did two smart pots, one that was buried, one that wasn't because I was so skeptical about this and it didn't do as well. So uh, now I may have overwatered it because it was on the same watering schedule as the one that was next to it that was raised. So I think that, I think it was just being overwatered. I should have had different zones or something, but, um, but yeah, I just want to mention you can bury them if you want to, if, if, if you don't have to water as much, you know, and, but yeah. Yeah. So once you have uh, your smart pot or your raised bed, the next stop is to, the next step is to fill it. So you could buy just potting mix from the store or something like that, but that's gonna be so expensive. I've never even tried doing that because they're like nine, ten bucks a bag for something you actually want. You don't know what compost is actually in there. Um, I don't trust compost out of a bag. I just don't understand how that process can. I don't. I just. I would just rather buy compost in bulk and then I know where it's coming or make it myself and then I know where it's coming from and what's in it. So um, I make my potting mix. I use the Mel's mix. This is from the Square Foot Gardening Method. I, I took it directly from there. It's a mix of vermiculite, peat moss, and compost. I've started switching to coconut core instead of peat moss. You can interchange them however you like. Um, make sure you gotta, you gotta soak the coconut core beforehand though. So if you're gonna be building something, the first time I used it, I was planning on using it that day. I bought it that morning. But well, that was a very frustrating experience trying to get that stuff hydrated and everything. So now I know that if I'm going to use coconut core, I buy it the day before. I put it in a 55 gallon barrel full of water and soak it so it's completely immersed. And then the what next is, day, it's, it's good. What to go. is coconut core? I mean, is it made out of coconut? It's made, it's, yeah, it's made out of, so it's a renewable resource. Okay. Like, uh, it's made out of coconut, so it's the coconut fibers that okay. are, I don't know how exactly how they make it, but it's a byproduct. I think it's a byproduct show. of. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Someone said something. Husk? Okay. From the husk, got gotcha. you. Okay. I don't know enough about coconuts. Like, uh, yeah, I just know it's made from coconut. They're big. Coconuts are big now in lots yeah. of things. So. Yeah. yeah, I think. I know coconut oils. When they process the coconuts, I believe they will take that husk and okay. reuse it. That's what we use here. Oh, we use okay. that here. Mm -hmm. And the peat mud is not renewable. No, it's not. A re it's, it's from the, the the forest bed floor up in up, up in oh, Canada. Wow. These, so it's not a renewable mm -hmm. resource. Yeah. Um, at um, OKC, Organics OKC, you can buy the smaller bricks too. Mm -hmm. oh. And it doesn't take so long to soak them. And it's great for small gardens like mine. Yep. Thank you. Okay, awesome. And then compost. Now, compost is the most important ingredient out of all. Um, the Square Foot Gardening book talks about having five different varieties of compost. Um, I don't give myself a number, but I stick to that as a methodology. If I try and get as many different compost sources as I can. Um, Minic materials is where I buy from right now. They have three different types there, so that covers three of my bases. They have a vegetable base, a manure base, and the third one, I don't know exactly what all of it's in that quite yet. Um, and then I have my own compost that I make at home. I have worm castings I use. Um, uh, any, uh, one thing I do want to mention about compost is you want to test it before you use it. So if you're getting from a place that you've never used before, uh, I pretty much do this with any compost I get every time. Um, because the first year that I gardened, I killed pretty much half my plants accidentally through compost that was tainted with herbicide. Um, and the reason for that is because I was using horse manure as one of my main ingredients. And horses graze on fields that are often sprayed with herbicides that are broad spectrum, long term herbicides that last up to three years. Um, so the, the, the horse eats it, it goes into the manure and it lasts in that for three years. So that was a big lesson that I learned. Um, and you can test compost easily, just not quickly. And the way that you test it is just to, you have like a, a flat of seeds, you know, like a seed starting tray, mm -hmm. and you fill half those containers with potty mix from the store, something sterile. Like I normally don't buy potty mix from the store, but I buy that because I know it's sterile. And then the other half, I do a mix of 
uh, just basically this is the same mix here with that compost, about 50% of that compost. And then you watch the two plants grow. Uh, I do peas for this test um, because peas are really fragile and if there's deformations, you'll see it pretty quick. So after about three weeks, by the time the plant has three or four true leaves, um, so what that means is when the, when the plant first sprouts, it has leaves that don't look like what the plant are going to look like the rest of the leaves. After that, all the leaves that follow are called true leaves. Once they have two or three sets of true leaves, then is generally when I feel pretty confident that I'm, the, 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 the test is successful. So you can just look at the plants and if there's any deformation, specifically like twisting and curling and things like that, that's really like the recognizable signature of herbicide damage like that. So that's what, and then, but it takes three to four weeks to get that, you know, test. So, um, uh, I guess technically there are ways to test for it in a lab, but it, there's not a way that you can do it cheaply. You know, it'd have to be something you send off to, like a whole analysis type thing. So, so that's a way you can test compost on your own. Um, you, again, you can also make compost really easy. Um, it's hard to make a lot of it that you would need. Like when I started out, like at this scale, it would have taken me. I don't know how much to make that much compost, so I had to buy a lot of it. Um, but uh, but w but now I pretty much have my own compost that's kind of powering the rest of it. So any new beds I build, I go buy. But for the compost that I use to replenish my beds every spring and every fall, I just use the stuff that I make. And to make compost, uh, I, I keep it simple. I don't bring in any um, animal byproducts anymore. Well, except for my rabbit. We have a rabbit, uh, a 20 pound Flemish giant. Wow. <laughs> His name is Roger. He's awesome. Um, and we only got him because like the, we wanted the manure because rabbit manure, you can use immediately. Um, he eats all my leftover stuff, you know, like he, so, um, so that's the only animal by byproducts I've used. But other than that, for my compost, I use a combination of wood chips, coffee grounds, uh, shredded fall leaves, um, Cotton seed husks, I've, I've, bought, I've got that in bulk before. Um, just any large amount of raw organic material I can get my hands on. Eggshells, uh, although typically like the eggshells and the food products like that, I'll put in the worm bin instead of the compost bin. Mm -hmm. um, the worms are much faster at breaking it down. I bury it so pests don't really get into it as much. And with the compost bin, I've got it between my house and my neighbor's house and I don't want there to be like, a, you know, I, I don't want to be an issue. So I keep that to just plant materials mostly, and then the food stuff I put into the worm bin, um, and then the worms turn that. And, and the cool thing about a worm bin too is not only do you get the same benefits you get through compost, but you also get added benefits of, of plant growth hormones because worm uh, manure or whatever it's called contains plant growth hormones. So, so you get that added benefit. So I put a scoop of that in pretty much everything that I plant. Um, the bottom of every hole when I plant seeds, I'll, I'll sprinkle it on top. Um, we have an outside worm bin and then I have an indoor one too uh, and you can make them really cheap just out of like uh, plastic totes. You want to have at least two layers with holes drilled in the top layer so the liquid can drain down because the worms can't be sitting in liquid. That's really the only requirement. Um, that and temperature they want to be between 50 and 80 degrees. Uh, for the bedding I just use um, shredded paper, just junk mail. That I, I, get, I shred that and then I put in coffee grounds and stuff like that for them to use and then after that it's just food scraps. Um, one thing I do want to mention too is the temperature is really important. So if it's going to, if it, it's really hard to have a worm bin outside in Oklahoma, but if you have a space that's full shade, like up against here, it would probably be okay. Um, and then you also cover it and then lay a bunch of burlap on it. You know, like they, they're really fragile the temperature. So, um, any questions about the soil mix or, or any of that? And this is pretty much all I use for fertilizer. I don't. Um, if you get the compost part right in the soil mix, then you don't have to use fertilizer. That's why it's so important. It's the food for the plants. Mm -hmm. Did you say it was 50% compost? And then would it be 25%? Um, that's on the test. Um, okay. when I'm, mm -hmm. when, I'm sorry, when you're testing compost. But when you're, when you're doing the mix, uh -huh. um, the Mel's mix recommends one-third, one-third, one-third. That's going to be really expensive. And honestly, I've started to back down on vermiculite a little bit. Because it's 30 bucks a bag for vermiculite. One of those bags gets you a four by eight. Um, so, I mean, and there's, it's a fine line between how much you can back down. I, I just kind of learned through doing, you know, the, I did the first ones exactly right. And then I started backing down. And then I backed down too much and I saw what happened. And then I went back. So now it's just kind of a, I can eyeball it. I can just look at it and see how much vermiculite's in it and know if it's gonna be a problem or not. Um, you can also substitute, um, I've, I've heard of substituting in sand to help with the drainage too, but you want to be careful because you mix sand and clay in the right proportion, it can make something really hard. So um, you don't want to, 
you know, like mix it directly with clay. But if you're doing like this own mix that you're making, you can mix some of that in. Perlite is a little cheaper than Rubik's Light too. I don't like it as much because this, I don't know, something about it just doesn't, I don't know, it's, it's, I'm, this is probably just me being weird, but uh, it should do the same thing as Vermiculite as well. So, and all the all the Vermiculite and the Perlite and the peat moss and the coconut door, all, all that does is just help with the growing medium. So it helps with water retention and it helps with drainage and all that kind of thing. So, and then if you had all compost, it could be too nutrient dense and too hot. So, so it just gives it balances out that. Um, the peat moss can be a little acidic, but the compost is usually alkaline, so that balances out too. Okay. Coconut core should be stable though. Any questions on that before we move on? Sorry. Okay. So the next step is to start planting. And I want to show this thing because when I, uh, the square foot gardening method, this makes it really easy, this thing called the seeding square. Um, so each vegetable has a number of how many can be planted per square. Uh, banana pepper is easy because it's one, but bush beans are nine. So what you would do is you would match up this, so the nine per square would be yellow on here. So it makes it really easy, especially for my kids. Because I can just tell them, and then my two-year-old is learning how to count through his, through this. She's learning colors through it. She's learning patterns through it. Like, it's, especially if you have kids, this is a really cool experience for them. And she loves just putting rocks in each one. Like they just love these things. Um, so I don't use this as much personally as anymore. Um, I kind of just eyeball things now. And and two, like um, I overplant and then thin down. So for cabbage, it's one per square. I just sprinkle quite a bit in a square and then I'll thin down as they grow and I'll eat those thinnings because those are basically just microgreens. Mm -hmm. And then once it's down to just, you know, once they get big enough, I'm down to just one and I've got that one cabbage plant there. But I hated it in the beginning whenever I would plant one cabbage and then I had all this space around it that was just not being used and it felt like I was wasting space. So, um, and that's the way nature would do it on its own anyway, is there'd be a bunch of seeds there, the biggest one wins and you know, mm -hmm. so, so that's the way I do like most everything now. Uh, with some exceptions, like I'm not gonna like tomatoes. I just transplant, so I'm not gonna put a bunch around it. Um, where do you get those? The yeah. what? The seeding scores. Where do you get? Uh, them? You can get these through the app. I've got links in here. Oh, okay. okay. Um, they're. I'm actually going to. Yeah, I may be selling these directly here soon. So okay. I've been talking. The, the maker of the seeding scores up in Canada, mm -hmm. and she's the really cool people. And we've been talking quite a bit, and I think there's an opportunity for us to work together. Okay. Cool. So. So I think I'll be, and then same with Smart Pots. I have an agreement with them now to start selling those directly as well. So it's, this thing is so crazy. It started off as I just like built an app last year to help people grow food, and now I'm hoping maybe this can be my full-time job eventually. Awesome. It's hard because it's a free app, but we have links to buy things in the app, and we get right now I think eight percent of each purchase through there. So if enough people download the app or enough people share it, then um, I'm excited about the opportunity to have a business model that doesn't require me to ask people for money. Yeah. You know, it's just if I help you solve a problem, then here's the you know here's a way to help repay me. So, okay. so I'm really excited about that because I hate people asking people for money. That's why I'm yeah. a computer guy. Like I'm not a sales guy. I'm so <laughs> uncomfortable doing that. So, um, so anyway, and the cool thing too is that these are these are products all that I that I recommend and that I believe in. I don't have to have random ads on my website for who knows what's gonna pop up. Like I'm, I can just recommend the things I like. Like it's I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> So, um, that's pretty much covers your basis on how to on how to plant seeds. I mean, it's really simple. You just figure out how many you need to go, and then how deep you need to plant them. Again, that's all in the app. It tells you right here how deep each seed, the, the seed depth, how many days it takes. Uh, what did I do? <coughs> Sorry. Um, how many days it takes for it to sprout there? Um, how tall it gets, and all that kind of thing. So you can use that to plan it out. Um, transplants. We're going to be transplanting some stuff here soon. You're going to see how simple it is too. Um, and the biggest mistake people make with transplants is they're too gentle with the plants, honestly. Um, especially if it's just a transplant that has some root bound going on. You need to, we'll, I'll show, we'll go in detail on that in a minute. But, um, transplanting is super simple. Um, and then some things need to be started indoors or bought uh, from a nursery that started indoors and transplanted. But the good news is most everything can just be direct seeded in the ground. The only things that I actually start indoors or buy a transplant of are cabbage, broccoli, if I grew cauliflower, I'd do that too. Um, tomatoes and peppers. Uh, pretty sure that's it. I don't think I'm forgetting anything. I would do Brussels sprouts if I were uh, if I were growing that too. Um, but everything else can pretty much be started directly from seed. 
And the reason why those other ones need to be started from tra or as transplants is just because of how long they take to grow. So if we were to start them directly outside, like tomatoes, you would have had to start it pretty much now. Then you're not going to get any tomatoes until the fall. So you could direct seed tomatoes right now, but you're just not going to get any until the fall. Um, whereas if you start it indoors, in uh, Valentine's Day is when I start them indoors for me. Um, and then uh, normally I would have already been able to transplant them. So it's kind of a nightmare right now because they're huge and like the, I'm not used to them being this large indoors. But usually I would have been able to already put them out and plant them, but not, not this weekend. So you're clear to do it now. But um, but yeah, so it's. Uh, Sorry, I'll push your head um, But yeah, that's, those are the only things that you have to really start indoors, and it's pretty simple. Um, if you do want to start stuff indoors, I have a video that details. We have a, uh, an indoor seed starting station that we built just from taking the wire racks and then hanging grow lights that we got. We got we got all ours off Craigslist for maybe, I think it was 10 to 12 bucks each is what we paid, and that was with lights too. So you can wow. find really good deals. Facebook Marketplace is a great yeah. place to look too. I have alerts set up for grow lights and shop lights, so I just get notified for any time one pops up. Well, at least back, I don't I have enough now, like, but when I was shopping for it, that's what I did. But that's how I shop for a lot of things. Yeah, I just set that kind of stuff. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, for, I don't really buy anything new anymore if I can help it. Um, and then crop rotation is something important I want to mention too, because, um, you know, I haven't mentioned a lot about diseases um, or, or anything like that. And really because you can avoid a lot of those issues just by practicing good crop rotation. So those diseases typically take a little bit of time to get established, unless you're bringing them from outside somewhere. But if they're setting up shop in your garden, it takes them you know, a year or two to get established in the soil. So if you're constantly rotating plants, like different family of plants specifically between, then the diseases typically stick to the same family. So they don't get a chance to get the snake hold going, and, and then you're able to avoid a lot of those issues. So. Um, I move things around, you know, each bed, uh, and, and I also don't do a whole bed of the same thing. So I'll never have like a whole bed of just tomatoes. I'll have a bed of tomatoes and onions and um, basil and oregano and things like that kind of all mixed around. And um, one of the big reasons for that, I've, I've touched a little bit about companion planting as far as how uh, it works on the the shading side of it, right? Like if it's on the west side of the bed, then it can shade things on the east. But another thing that companion plants really help with is with pest prevention um, and with like things like disease prevention. Um, so the way that I incorporate some of those ideas is I use uh, oregano, rosemary, sage, thyme. Those are, at least one or two of those is in every single one of my beds. And the reason for that is because the way that pests find what they're looking for is mostly through smell. So if you have a bed that's all tomatoes, it's really easy for that tomato hornworm moth to find it, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have tomatoes with basil all around it, and y'all know how strongly scented basil is, well, that same principle applies to insects. So it masks the scent of the tomato, and it's hard for them to find it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I have, a, and oregano too improves the flavor of stuff around it. Oregano is just a super plant, so I have it everywhere. Um, and again, I have that collection, that collection problem, so I have like four different types of oregano, so I've got to fit them in somewhere. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, 40% of my beds are herbs, and we use them a lot for cooking. I use them for, we use them for all sorts. I'm trying to get better at this, actually, because there's a lot of medicinal ways you can use herbs. Mm -hmm. I want to get better at using uh, that type of thing. Uh, Lori Coates is a friend of mine that teaches classes over uh, My Raggedy Herbs, if you've never heard of her. She's an expert on medicinal and culinary herbs. I'm trying to learn a lot from her right now, but um, yeah, it's called My Raggedy Herbs. She's on Facebook, and they do, she has a teaching garden through the Cleveland County uh, Master Gardener Program. And out in Tuttle, so she does a lot of classes out of her home there. But that's one area that I want to learn more about. Just so I know that uh, I have all these herbs going around and I underutilize them. Like I only use sage sparingly. I know I should be using it every day. I mean, um, so that's what I'm trying to get better at is actually using some of the stuff that I grow. I feel like I got really good at growing it, and then I was like, well, now what? So, um, especially some of that stuff, like you know, savory. Like I haven't used it properly. Like a lot of herbs like that. So. Be looking for things being added in the app on that front because that's kind of my interest right now. So that's really what I'm focused on writing about and shooting videos about. There's some good webinars out there. About <coughs> yeah. Floricopia. Floricopia. I've never heard of them. I haven't heard of that. They sell essential oils and things like that. But the founders mm -hmm. have a lot of webinars about medicinal use of herbs. Awesome. I'll check that and out. The Shift Network. They have a lot of yeah. uh, all kinds of. Some of it is a little woo-woo, but you know, mm -hmm. there's other more. <laughs> That's, That's the challenge. Is trying stuff. to find and that. And so like, you, they, if you look yeah. on there, they, there's usually somebody that's talking about. Awesome. Herbs. Yeah. Thank you. We'll be yeah, having uh, medicinal herbs 
class. I cannot remember when it is. I oh, you have one here? Yeah, yeah up on yeah. the. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, June 30th. June 30th. Yeah. Who's with Steph Stephanie um, Holloman, who's actually lived in Chile for the last 20 years, but she's oh, back really? in the mm -hmm. States again for a while. So. That is going to be so interesting. I always love talking mm -hmm. to people that have been in other countries growing because they bring back so many things that I just. I mean, right. uh, yeah, like uh, there's so many plants I've heard of that have been brought over for things mm -hmm. like that. that uh, yeah, yeah, very cool. Um, so any questions about planting before we move on to, to the next step of watering? You, this is not, not about planting, but it's a problem. I don't know for you guys, but we certainly have it. Uh, do you have a good natural way to get rid of water bugs? Water bugs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's a lot of creek beds. A lot of housing additions are, you know, they've got creek beds close by, so... Mm -hmm. The water bugs, you know, they, do you know what I'm oh, talking about? Oh, mosquitoes and like no, no, the ones that stay on the they water. They look like yeah, they look like cockroaches, the but yeah. they're not. Do, do you know do what they I'm cause? Do they cause problems in the garden or? I mean, well, well they're just really gross and they yeah, get they're nasty. everywhere. They're they're in the cockroach family. Right. And gotcha. They're, they're they're not you know German brown, but you have a larger hmm. uh, in the cockroach family, and they they are nasty looking. You probably just don't want them to be around. I wonder if yeah. dragonflies prey on their larvae. Or in a dragon. So dragon there's a, there's a lot of um, natural predators that lay their eggs in water and stuff. Uh -huh. And I don't know anything about that, so I'm purely speculating. Okay. But I know they eat a lot of larvae, things like mm -hmm. that. So dragonflies, okay. um, fireflies are a mm -hmm. uh, are a great uh, uh, okay. beneficial to have around, and they lay their eggs in water. So um, in the app, let me, let me they're look. a decomposer though. They don't cook anything. They just eat dogsters. Fireflies and lightning bugs? Yeah. The mm -hmm. water bugs. Oh, no, 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 no
So I think the system still works. If you only have one or two beds, that's a great system to do. It's just PVC. Uh, it's super simple to get going. Um, it's cheap. But um, if you're going to be at a larger scale, then this drip irrigation is the way to go. Uh, where, where do you guys buy your from? Your um, stuff from? We mostly mail ordered it. Through uh, which company? Irrigation Direct or Irrigation Mart. Okay. Or Dripworks is great because they, um, they give a lot of advice when you're getting set up, but they're a little more expensive. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they're worth it for the advice. Yeah. Dripworks? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, that's the, one of my hopes this year is to convert all mine over to that. Um, I'm hoping I'll be able to find time in the, or find room in the budget for that. Um, and then to automate it right now, I just have an Orbit automated timer. So uh, you can get them on Amazon, or I've got a link to one on Amazon here. The one I have it has four outlets with four different zones I can program. So mm -hmm. with that, that pretty much covers my watering right now because um, I just move those hose ends from bed to bed, and then I always have four that are on a schedule. So basically the way I do is I just go move that hose from one bed to the next mm -hmm. one, and then I just have a, a system for where I move each one out there. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I do it with, with the Orbit. They're really easy to program. They work well. Um, I definitely recommend doing automation, though, because uh, especially for someone like me, because I'm not a very consistent person. Um, days will go by, and I'll think, oh, what day is it? You know, like, it's just things slip. You know, I, I'll be lost in my world, and I just, mm -hmm. I'll slip on it. So, and my plants suffered a lot because of it, because it would be, uh, they would be inconsistently watered. It would be too much watering for a few weeks and it would be not enough watering for a few weeks. It was just, it didn't work well. But when I switched to this and it took over watering for me, then um, I noticed a big difference in my plants because I wasn't killing them. <laughs> um, so... Any herb is going to be great for that. Um, the app has companions listed okay. um, that give you specific herbs that kind of work well with some with others, but you can't get away, you can't get wrong with pretty much any herb. Okay. Um, so this is an example of like a kitchen herb garden. Let's with this one. Let's do uh, a tomato. So if you want to have a tomato in a smart pot, first of all, this is a great size for a tomato. I see people trying to grow <laughs> tomatoes in something this size a lot, and it's not going to work in Oklahoma unless you water it like every day. Um, so if I were to do a tomato in a smart pot like this, um, first of all, get a, a patio or a container variety of tomato. Uh, it's not gonna get as big, it's gonna be easier to maintain something like this. Um, there's two types of tomatoes, there's determinate and indeterminate. Um, indeterminate is viney, it's indeterminate how long it's gonna get. Determinate is it gets to a determined height and it stops, like three or four feet. So Roma, San Marzano, those are popular determinates. Any type of patio, those would be great for this. So you put the tomato in the middle. Um, tomatoes are a little different than other plants too in that how you plant them because you guys see this. See these little hairs mm -hmm. along the tomato? Each one of those can become a root. So a lot of plants aren't like this where if you bury them it's going to cause problems. Tomatoes are just going to produce new roots along there. So there's a couple different ways you can plant tomatoes. Some people plant the whole plant like directly down like this where it's completely buried. That's one way you can do it. Another strategy is to make something like this, like a little divot, you lay it down like this, and then you can cover it, and then you can kind of turn just like that, and then eventually it's gonna turn on its own. Um, that's another way you can do it too. So, but tomatoes are pretty much the only thing you can do that with, and most plants will be, will be hurt by doing that. So don't try and do that with, with everything else. <laughs> so, again, I'm just gonna put a couple inches. Glad I didn't spill any, that would've been. Okay, so we got the tomato in the middle, and I mentioned earlier, so basil is a great friend to tomatoes. Not only does it help repel pests, but it also makes tomatoes taste better. So I would go through and put basil all around here. Now, if you let this basil get full size, if you let all of them get full size, uh, if you get, I'm sorry, if you let all of them get full size, it would be way too much basil in here. So mm -hmm. make sure you stay on top of harvesting it. Mm -hmm. You're gonna want to grow this as a contained basil. Mm -hmm. um, one thing about basil too is you want to pinch the tops off. So if you pinch like this top off here, it's gonna get bushy instead okay. of getting like that. Mm -hmm. I saw one over here a minute ago that was real tall and like mm -hmm. um, you want to get you want if you, if you start doing that like from the beginning. Or like, right about now would probably be a good time to start doing it. 
Hmm. Maybe a little bit longer because they, they, need, they need leaves too. But mm -hmm. the point is just pinch that top off and then it continues to bush out. Okay. So, so I would go through and put... And, and something like this, I would maybe do maybe three. That might be overkill. But again, if you just stay on top of harvesting it, then it'll be fine. And um, it's going to help because it's going gonna, it's gonna to put a really strong scent, right? And then to trellis this, what you could do, it's kind of difficult with smart pots to trellis sometimes. What I've started doing is just having things next to a trellis. So like have like that T-post thing I mentioned, like the two stakes in the ground, have that here, and this would kind of grow up and I attach to it. Or um, I really like, I'm sure you have them here somewhere, the cages that are homemade. In the way back, yeah. Okay, kind of looks like one there. That's a compost sifter, but it kind of, just imagine like one of these things made into a circle and attached together. I really like those. So you could make one the size of this and you can buy that wire uh, in bulk at like Home Depot and Lowe's or whatever. And then, uh, no, it's over in the, um, so it's, it's a concrete remesh pan, strips, but they're in circles. So it's over, like, if you go to the place where you buy concrete and stuff like that at those places, it's because it's laid down when they lay concrete to hold the concrete together. So it's over in that section, and that's why you get it so much cheaper, because it's not used for gardening. Um, yeah, so. You could use bamboo for some things, like peppers would be great to use bamboo for. The thing about this tomato is it's going to get really big, and like, and it's going to take, like, if you tried to bamboo thing, this thing, it'd take like maybe like five bamboo stakes and like it would be a nightmare to try to pan it. But those cages, like if you just have that cage around this whole thing, now it just stays within that cage. So, and even, and that's how, that's how I like doing tomatoes. I don't, you can do tomatoes on the panel, like on the fence panel, like I mentioned, but I'm not a good enough gardener. Um, I, I, for days go by, I, I don't trellis and then I'm left with this stuff. It's, so I just, I know myself. So I've switched to only growing these types of tomatoes in those cages so I can just watering handles on my own you know like I, I'm not gonna mess it up so um, if you're better than I am then you know like uh, I, I do want to mention that the, the the vining tomatoes like the um, the the smaller the tomato the easier it's going to be to grow here in Oklahoma um, so uh, the really big tomatoes can be difficult because of lack of water and heat and all that kind of thing. The smaller, to the smaller tomatoes just have less room for air to get started. Mm -hmm. So the cherry tomatoes, are those are always going to work, and you're going to be left with cherry tomatoes the rest of your life in that spot because they're going to come up on their own. So, so that's a great way to start with tomatoes is with the cherries. Or the romas. Like, um, you know, the, if this, I'm not sure what this is, but if it was a roma, it would get to probably about this tall, and it would spit out kind of all the tomatoes at once, and then maybe another round. So it's great for salsas. The indeterminate spit on spit out continuously. So I'm gonna leave this here and we'll move on down to this. So this is going to be an example of uh, a greens bed. So um, this is one of those things we were spending a lot of money on, like lettuce and spinach and kale. Um, so if you wanted to have a greens bed, this would be a great way to do it. To where you could just take this is kale here, this is chard, um, this is chard too, and then. Uh, lettuce, you can just sprinkle lettuce seed around. So I'm not going to go through and plant all these, but I think you guys get the idea for seeing those. But this would be a great idea as well, is to have just like a bed of greens. Um, what size is that one? This one is probably like a 20, 25 gallon, and it's overkill for greens. If you're going to do greens, you could do something. They don't have to be as deep, like window boxes, like that type of size. Um, that smart pot that I showed, that big bag bed, that's a great option. Just, um, just fill that whole thing, and then you just got. One of those is going to give you more greens than you can keep up with for two people, probably. That's one of the great things about greens is they're so prolific, and if you cut them, like you can go there and see they cut some greens the other day. In three weeks, they'll have new ones back. So uh, you can go through and, and harvest from one section, and then let the next section next grow, and then you just have continuous greens until it gets too hot. Which is the thing about Oklahoma is greens like lettuce and spinach bolt when the temperature gets above about 85. What that means is they're going to sit up. It's probably one under somewhere that's already done it. Uh, they'll send up a, a center stalk and then they'll go to flower and they'll get real bitter. Um, so the good thing about the flowers is bees love them and they draw in a bunch of pollinators so it's good to leave some around. And they'll also self seed, like they'll drop seed and drop back down. But there are varieties, slow bolt is one that tolerates heat pretty well. It might be a little late to get started with it, but if it's in the shade, then you got a better chance. 
So that's why these smart parts are so great with something like that because you can move them around. Yeah, but uh, side yeah, or even a north side. Like really? right now, okay. like east side in the spring. But if it's summer, if you want any chance of it, it yeah. has to be full shade or. Okay. Um, so far, the longest I've been able to push greens is like mid-May, end of May. How about y'all? How long do y'all push greens? Some years early June. Like early June. Shade. And there's, like on lettuce, there's some of the lettuces are more heat tolerant, like the, um, what do they call it, the Cavian, or, um, so you can, you know, cheat a little bit by a few weeks, but it's really, it's just a few weeks that it buys you, it's not that much. And they have the, you see the white covers they have right here, the floating row covers? Mm -hmm. Those are great too, because that gives them a little bit, that gives them a little bit of shade. Uh, those are also good for, um, uh, for protection in, in the cold too. So that's something you can do. And another thing I want to mention, the temperature sensors for plants, like where they, you know, like is in the base of the plant where the soil is. It's mm -hmm. not in the leaves or anything like that. So if you can trick the plant into being cooler there, so like on those 100 degree days, for example, my bed of lettuce, I'll run my irrigation every hour for five minutes because that water's cooler. And now I'm using that cool water to my advantage, right? Because mm -hmm. yeah. it makes those plants, that, I mean, it doesn't always work, you know, and but, but it just, it, every little thing you can do, you know, helps and can go a long way, so. And then this last bed, we had some other herbs. I think we probably covered everything, but these are just some other herbs you can plant. And this is another example of, um, you know, a, a, this is Lovich here, and this is Dill, but um, these are great things to have around, like your patio if you use, you know, things like that. Um, I also do a lot of mosquito repellent type things with smart pots around, around my patio. Uh, lemongrass and, uh, there's a, it's kind of a story about the, what is the name of the mosquito plant? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure about that one because I've, so the, the, this is, I'm getting way off topic here, but I'm gonna just digress for like a minute. The citronella plant, um, the one you see in the stores is a geranium, and the citronella plant that repels mosquitoes is, or is I need to know more about this, but I know there's like a, there's a bit of a marketing thing happening there where people are buying something that isn't actually working, so. Bill Ferris at Prairie Wind Nursery could tell you all about it because that's who I learned it from. So, if you don't know him, by the way, go check out his, his place. I'm not getting paid by any of these people. I hope it doesn't sound like I'm marketing. I just I really believe in these people and I believe like they're like what they're doing here and I want to help promote some of the cool people around Oklahoma that are doing good stuff. And Bill's where I get all my herbs from because he's like me. He's a nerd and he likes to collect things and he's been doing it for 30 years here. So, uh, Bill Ferris at Prairie Wind Nursery. It's in Norman. And they'll have a booth at the. Um Garden Festival at the Myriad next weekend, next like yeah. Saturday. And I'll be out there too. So. Oh, great. Oh, cool. Yeah, I think Bill and I will be doing some presentations together. We do a, on our website, we have a presentation that he and I did that was, we went over 10 different herbs, how to grow them, how to cook with them. And he has all sorts of random, interesting stuff he talked about in all of them. And I did one with Lori Coates too. So I've got all sorts of videos like this on our website. That's why we're recording here, just because I like to live stream and record this kind of thing, just to share it. So um, pretty much everything I do, I try and record and get it uploaded. So. Um, not in the smart pots. Um, okay, let me rephrase that. Come July, I do. Not right now, I'm not. But uh, I'll start with shredded leaves as mulch, uh, and then I'll add wood chips on top of that. Um, that's for a number of reasons. One, the mulch is the shredded leaves. Are just, that's actually providing nutrients back into the soil, whereas wood chips can steal nitrogen back from it. Now, they'll release it back once the wood chips break down, but still, I like to have that buffer of leaves between it. Um, and then I'll just kind of add mulch as the season goes, once we get into July. And then I just leave it there through the winter because it's. Uh, you know. You just spread the leaves with the mower longer. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <coughs> well, any questions or anything? And next Saturday is the Garden Fest at the Myriad, and it's also something here? Yeah, and then, so go to the Myriad in the morning, <laughs> and then come here in the afternoon at 1 o'clock. From 1 to 2 will be our um, food forest workshop with Paul Mays here. Cool. And well, actually, you can find him here, but we'll actually be over. Um, at the food forest, which is our, right next to our hoop house on 32nd Street, just before you get to Weston, you can see the hoop house and the food forest is right next to it. So, um, and, also, and also we we are going to be getting rid of some of our tomato cages because now we have half our tomatoes in our hoop house and we'll be selling them cheap. So if you're interested in just buying a tomato cage or two, um, you can get them from us next week. And if you want to make sure you get notices about upcoming classes, you can sign up here and we'll get you on the newsletter list too. Okay, thanks for that. And we so have that was, oh. classes twice a month all the way through Thanksgiving. November, yeah. Yay. They're not every other week, they're twice a month. So yeah, <laughs> check on the website and figure out what we're having, when we're having it. And sometimes it's two weeks in a row and some, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that was absolutely fantastic. Thank yeah. you very much.
actually even got even me, who I'm totally not into apps. You've even got me interested. So. <laughs> <laughs> you did a good job. What's the name of your app? Uh, from Seed to Spoon. Seed to Spoon. Yeah, and then we're on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and. I consider it. Well, I just hit one button and it goes everywhere. So I don't even know where all we are. It just, it just happens. So. That's good. You can download it on their website. Uh, on my website, yes, seedthespoon.net, or just search for Seed the Spoon in the App Store. Okay. Or if you search for gardening in the App Store, we're number four now. So it, you know, I know, it's like I didn't, we were like number 200 when we first started. They jumped up in a hurry. It's a little overwhelming. Two bucks for your app.